I'm just a fool for your stockings, I believe in. This will be the last video for this unit. Uh, there's a lot more to local exhaust ventilation than what we've covered in this unit and the previous units, but I think this is going to give you a foundation uh, for down the road. If, now, if you do need to, to know more about local exhaust ventilation, uh, you could take an entire class in local exhaust ventilation or a, an entire class in ventilation, not at NSU, but you could take at other schools an entire class on industrial ventilation that would go into much greater detail with uh, uh, discussion of local exhaust, dilution, and general ventilation. Oh, and we're not done with ventilation. We, our next unit, will focus on dilution ventilation and general ventilation. Uh, this these last two units just been local exhaust ventilation now there is some overlap between as far as the 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 structure of the systems and such but uh, uh, in general dilution ventilation different objective than what we have with local exhaust ventilation uh, for this last video we're going to talk about uh, monitoring and evaluating the performance of local exhaust ventilation systems you know, once the system's in place, it has to be monitored. Maintenance has to be performed periodically. And as a safety professional, we may we, you know, we may not design the system. We not, might not be the engineer that is most knowledgeable knowledgeable about the system, but we might be the that frontline person that would be first to notice a problem with the ventilation system. Uh, we're going to talk about monitoring, evaluating. We're also going to talk about uh, a little bit more about design Again, most of that's going to be an engineer thing but we will talk a little bit about designing a fixed in place system and then I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about portable local exhaust ventilation systems okay. well, let's talk about monitoring one of the best tools for monitoring the effectiveness or the functioning of a local exhaust ventilation system is a smoke tube the smoke tube will generate a non-toxic uh, vapor or smoke that can be used around the, the inlet points, the hoods, to see if the system is capturing the contaminants that it should be capturing. You know, the smoke gives us a visible indicator of whether the system is actually capturing uh, the contaminants. I mean, there are other ways you could do it as well, but this, the, the smoke tubes are the way to go. Uh, smoke tubes uh, similar to this are also used uh, for fit testing of respirators and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the last unit of the semester respirators and respirator fit testing uh, 
we identify drafts. Again, we can identify whether it's capturing, ca <clears throat> excuse me, capturing the contaminants. We can identify drafts with the smoke tube that may be interfering with the performance of our system. <coughs> that frog is persistent. I think I got him though. Again, identify capture range. We can start when we're holding the smoke tube at the inlet. We can start right up next to the inlet gradually move away from the inlet till we get to the point where the uh, contaminant or the smoke is not being captured effectively. We, that allows us to identify the range uh, of capture for whatever contaminants it, it is we're working with. Um, yeah, the capture range refers to the area in front of the hood from which smoke is captured. Uh, 180 degrees, we also, it's not you, you test side to side as well. It's not just it's not just a distance in line with the airflow. You're you're testing either side of the inlet to assess the system's ability to capture uh, material up to a 180 degrees of capture range. And here's a, a short little video to show you how the smoke tube device could be used to assess the effectiveness of your local exhaust ventilation system. And there is no audio with this, but you can see they're using a smoke tube or they're calling it a smoke pencil. They're uh, shooting some smoke out there to see if it's been captured. It should be uh, they, you know, this is a belt sanding system. Material should be sucked down into the into the sanding uh, table there. In a real simple test, anybody can do this to see if, uh, to get a basic understanding of whether your uh, system is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And notice he's going back and forth across the face of the <coughs> of the of the sander and different distances away from the sander just to assess the capture range. Here we have a device, this is a band saw. And they have a flexible uh, movable uh, hood, receiving hood. And they're trying, they're, they're, they're testing the system with the hood in various locations. Notice the smoke being sucked up into the, into the inlet there. It's like they may be having some of the the contaminant escape. I don't I don't see the inlet. Oh, okay, there it is around the other side. <coughs> see there. Yeah, that that's a potential problem there with the material being sent back toward the operator. There's a table saw. And we see the blade guard slash hood over the 
uh, that covers the blade and then the the duct work the flexible duct work attached to the inlet slash cover or guard this would be a device used if there was any soldering work going on a lot of the contaminants seems to be avoiding capture with this arrangement yeah I'm thinking maybe they need to raise the work surface of the, the contaminant is not being captured. See if they raise the work surface up in front of the inlet there it's going to be more effective. A scroll saw. And scroll saws <laughs> they're a little bit different that's gonna it, because a lot of scroll saws will have a an air supply tube that blows onto the work surface to blow the material away from the blade so the operator can see uh, the work that's taking place see the cut as you know scroll saws are real are for really fine uh, work detailed type of work so that that stream of air blows down onto the work surface blows the sawdust and stuff away so the operator can see what they're doing for that fine detailed work so that would be a unique challenge there uh, with the local exhaust ventilation system and a scroll saw but the main point there was uh, so you could see how the smoke tube uh, would be used to assess the uh, effectiveness of your local exhaust ventilation system. In local exhaust ventilation systems we want our inlet as close to the uh, point source as possible uh, and we want to position it so that it will most affect the hood so that it will most effectively uh, remove the contaminant and the smoke tube can help us determine that. Here are some devices that we can use for measuring the velocity in our systems. Uh, these devices would be measuring velocity at, say, an, an inlet. Uh, there are other devices for measuring the induct velocity. Uh, what we have here is a thermal anemometer up in the upper right corner of the slide and then we have a rotating vane anemometer here. Now the thermal anemometer, there's a heated probe. This is a heated probe and uh, it's inserted into the airstream and the velocity is calculated based upon how rapidly the heat is removed from the, the heated probe or how rapidly the temperature of the probe decreases. As the air uh, blows across it, it's going to reduce the temperature of the probe. And that information is used to calculate the velocity of the air movement. Now the rotating vane anemometer, that is a more direct. You have this rotating vane in here. You put that in the duct or at the, or the end or in the inlet, and it's gonna cause those blades to move and that's going to be your direct measurement of the velocity. Now the rotating vane anemometer, this is best for high velocity systems. Uh, the rotating vane or the thermal anemometer may give you uh, an incorrect velocity reading if it's a higher velocity airstream. Uh, if we need to assess the velocity in a duct uh, the the uh, person 
doing the assessment could perform a duct velocity traverse. This is where we measure the velocity in the duct at several different locations inside the duct. We will, we will uh, insert instruments, drill holes, insert instruments into the duct work and take measures at different locations. Now, the, the reason for doing this is to get an average velocity uh, across the entire diameter of the duct. The velocities may not be uniform in all parts of the duct work. So you take the averages of all the recorded velocities. Again, multiple holes allow uh, probes to test the velocity in different areas of the duct. Now this same approach can be used for testing pressure, doing a, a duct traverse for pressure testing with pressure testing instruments. If it's a velocity uh, traverse, we're testing for the velocity of the air movement. With pressure, testing for pressure with different instruments. Now, if performing this type of, of uh, evaluation, the measurements taken should be at least seven and a half diameters from any elbows, branch ducts, or blast gates, any what's considered a disturbance in the airflow, anything that's not a straight line airflow. If there's a change in the direction of the airflow, um, you need to be at least seven and a half diameters from that change in direction. Now for pressure testing, we could use the same basic approach. We drill holes into the ductwork. We insert a pitot tube attached to a manometer uh, or a, uh, a gauge. Here we have a pitot tube co uh, connected to a gauge and I'll show you a manometer on the on an upcoming slide. Now we drill holes 1 16th to 1 8th inch, uh, remove burrs uh, which could interfere with the airflow. And again we want to be seven and a half diameters from elbows, dampers, branches and so on. Uh, Pito tube inserted into the hole. And then the the airflow, you want the the inlet of the pitot tube so that the airflow is blowing into that inlet. So in this particular example here, the airflow is going this way. And here's a, a, a gauge that could be attached to a pitot tube and here is a digital manometer. This is the whole kit that you would need. It comes with the tubes, all of the hoses that you would use to connect the digital uh, readout or the manometer to the pitot tubes. Um, the measurements uh, in the measurement, we're talking about pressure, so we could be measuring pascals, inches of water column, or even pounds per square inch, depending on whichever units we prefer to use. Uh, now, pressure testing can also be taken or conducted at other locations within our ventilation system. We can test the pressure at the hood, the fan, uh, air treatment units perhaps, in some systems, uh, it may be advantageous to have pressure sensors permanently installed for continual monitoring. You can have pressure sensors that are wired to a digital readout or wired into the computer system uh, of your facility so that you could keep a, a constant eye on the pressure within the system. Because again, pressure, you know, the fan is the heart. The heart, the heart that causes the pre pressure differential that's necessary for the, uh, the system to work properly. And pressure is, if the pressure's not right, it's not gonna function properly. You gotta, gotta keep an eye on the pressure. But sometimes, a lot of times though, it's not gonna be the pressure that you notice first when you have a problem. Uh, so let's talk about some problem indicators. Again, pressure is going to be the, be the big one here. If we see a pressure deviation of 10% or more from one measurement to the next, that's an indicator. We need to examine that further or call in the engineer to, to, to look at that more closely. 
but pressure may not pressure change may not be the first thing we noticed uh, notice uh, going wrong with our system what we may notice first is a change in the velocity um, once we notice that change in velocity then we that's that's our uh, that's our uh, signal to look at the pressure within the system. If we notice that change in the velocity, then we're going to test that pressure. Uh, if there's, in addition to uh, the 10% or more deviation from one test to the next, there we might notice a sudden change in the, in the pressure in the system. But usually we're gonna notice that in terms of velocity first. Uh, some potential causes that can affect velocity and pressure in the system. It could be a clogged up duct, a portion of the duct that's got a clog in it. A loose fitting that's allowing air loss from the system. If air is escaping from the system, that's going to affect our pressure in the system. Uh, could be filters in our system. It could be a clogged or plugged duct. It could also be a clogged filter if we have any filters that are uh, collecting contaminants from the airstream as part of our air treatment system. Or maybe it's possible that it's not un uncommon to see other filters located within the uh, ventilation system, other filters besides filters that may be associated with an air treatment system. Those filters get clogged up, it's going to affect the performance of our system. There may be a fan problem that is uh, causing uh, pressure and velocity uh, to be subpar within our system. Uh, and there's when you're talking just about fans, or you look at the motor, look at the drive belt, are the impellers, have they been damaged, are the, are the blades been damaged? Those types of things can lead to problems with the fan. Uh, those are just some quick things that we may do as safety professionals to assess the performance of our local exhaust ventilation system. I think the most valuable is that smoke tube. You know, put, you know, squirt out some smoke at our inlet. Is it capturing uh, the smoke that we're generating with the smoke tube? That's going to be our best, easiest, no brain uh, indicator of how well the system's functioning. Uh, if we get further into, or maybe the system's not functioning well, we use the smoke tube test and it doesn't seem to be uh, capturing the smoke, then we look at velocity, then we look at pressure, pressure perhaps using other methods. Then again, we can also call the ventilation engineer or the ventilation consultant in to help also uh, if there is a problem in our system. Uh, I've already said multiple times that we are probably, you know, as a safety manager, even with the CSP, even with the CIH, um, we are probably not going to be designing and building our ventilation systems, but we do need to know the contaminants. Uh, if we do need to be more involved in designing a system, work with fan suppliers. Fan suppliers, in many instances, they will help design the system for you. If you're buying their system, if you're buying their fan, that is, again, the heart of the system, they will provide uh, uh, guidance on the other components of the system that will allow that fan to work most efficiently and be most effective for capturing your contaminants. Uh, another resource if you need to get more involved in designing and building a system would be the industrial ventilation manual from the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Uh, then finally, this, is, this, is, this would be my go-to if I was in a facility um, where I needed ma a major overhaul of the ventilation system, or I may maybe I need the initial implementation of a ventilation system, I'm going to hire a subcontractor, an engineer that is a specialist in industrial ventilation. They're gonna they're gonna focus on the fans, the ducts, the hood designs, air treatment systems. They're going to be able to they're going to be best qualified to put together the right system for whatever your operation is. And we're talking about a fixed in place ventilation system. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, get away from the fixed ventilation systems or the fixed in place ventilation systems. Let's talk about portable 
local exhaust ventilation systems. Um, there are several examples of effective portable local exhaust ventilation systems out there. They're self-contained units, uh, affordable, they're easy to set up and easy to use. And what we see in the picture here is one of those portable units. This is a Hilti local exhaust vacuum system. It's connected by a hose to a grinding tool that's being used uh, to uh, grind out the grout joint in this brick wall. That's probably a tuck pointing operation. They're, grout, they're grinding out the grout that's in place and they're going to be placing new grout in the groove that's being created. Now if they didn't have this system running there this guy would be covered in dust. He would this is an operation that would create a lot of silica dust. Uh, silica and if the if the grout had any other additives uh, there could be other contaminants as well uh, in addition to the silica. But these systems do work really well. We used a lot of these in the, in the bridge construction industry. We did a lot of grinding and sawing and cutting with concrete of, of concrete. And if these systems are maintained properly, uh, they will do an excellent job of collecting the dust at the source, uh, at the source, at the point source. Now I say affordable, you're looking probably, you know, Hilti's the best uh, system in my opinion. I think most would, would agree with me on that. It's also one of the most expensive, the Hilti portable systems. You're probably looking at $4,000 for this setup here, but that's less than the cost of an OSHA citation. Uh, it's also uh, less than uh, the harm the, less than the cost of the harm that could be caused by a worker inhaling silica dust for eight, ten hours a day uh, for, for five or six years. So it's, it's a good investment, even at $4,000. Yeah, we had these systems all over Kiwit, uh, my, my previous employer. Um, uh, in addition to uh, operations where you're generating silica dust, uh, you can have portable systems that would remove the contaminants that are generated during welding or cutting. Also contaminants that may be present for, uh, for a confined space entry. And there are so many tools out there that have been designed to connect to uh, these types of vacuums. Uh, when the new silica uh, regulations came out for the construction industry in 2017, there was a uh, uh, all of the manufacturers of, of these tools, they were ready to go. They had the systems ready to go to market. They had actually already been available uh, before the new silica regulations. But there's no excuse for a company not to provide protection to workers. Um, workers performing these types of tasks, say with a grinder or a saw or whatever may be generating uh, the silica dust or other contaminant that, that may be encountered. Here are some other examples. Again, these are all Hilti. <laughs> Again, I'm a Hilti guy. Uh, this is a drill here. They're, they're drilling into a concrete wall. This slightly different model. Uh, this is a um, angle grinder. They're, it's basically the same tool that this gentleman's using but it's set up slightly different, uh, slightly, there's a slightly different setup. Uh, here it's set up for um, creating, uh, for removing the grout, creating that groove uh, the, at the grout joint. Here it's set up for face grinding, which most concrete structures, uh, it, you know, we don't appreciate this unless we're a part of, the, of that world, but most concrete structures uh, there's a face grinding, you smooth off the, 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 the rough surface, and then there's oftentimes a decorative grout finish applied to uh, the, the rough structure that was, that was in place. But a lot of grinding involved. I've, uh, the, the silica uh, sampling that I talked about earlier in the semester, uh, 
that was that that's what was going on a lot of grinding on concrete projects and like I said Hilti's the best but Bosch Milwaukee DeWalt Makita uh, there are even backpack uh, versions of these portable systems the operator wears it on their back everything's self-contained I didn't like the backpack versions though they they weren't as effective I didn't think as uh, as this type of setup and he'll and we did some testing uh, as far as uh, taking samples when these devices were in use and very effective removal of the of the contaminant now here is a, a larger uh, device with a built-in portable local exhaust ventilation system this these are cyclonic filtration systems uh, what this device does this is a dowel drilling machine and it's this is a four gang drill it's drilling four holes simultaneously into a freshly poured freshly cured concrete slab and once the holes are in place they will epoxy in or grout in uh, rebar and once the rebar is all grouted in then they can pour the next lane of concrete or the next the next section of concrete and the dowels are important for keeping everything uh, keeping the uh, the slab unified as one unit but a lot of dust you know, this was from one of my jobs in Denver this was a subcontractor working and uh, you can see a little bit of dust being created uh, in the photo but not nearly uh, not nearly the amount of dust that would be in the air if this system uh, wasn't set up the way it's set up here pretty effective now this is getting away from local exhaust ventilation systems but when you're dealing with silica another another way of managing silica exposure is through a wet process wet process meaning we're keeping the material wet we're keeping the sawdust wet there's a continuous water spray that keeps the dust from becoming airborne that can be very effective also and a lot of tools that are used for working on concrete they will have have a uh, have a place for attaching a water hose onto the tool you attach the water hose onto the tool keeps that constant flow of water going on the blade and on the material and very little real virtually no exposure if those things are working properly and another example of a portable local exhaust ventilation system this is on an asphalt milling machine this we have the asphalt milling machine we have the local exhaust ventilation system built into it now this is a small milling machine this will only take four feet of asphalt at, at one pass but again it's the way it's set up it does an admirable excellent job of keeping the silica dust and other contaminants that go along with with milling asphalt out of the air and out of the workers lungs keeping it out of the workers lungs that's what it's all about and there are other options as well I, I have a whole other section on woodworking and sawdust that I used to use but I know some of you are doing sawdust uh, and I, some of you are doing silica too so I don't go as far as I could go with silica as far as the different options for uh, protecting workers from silica uh, but you know, there's a lot a lot of other options a lot of other tools out there for different industrial slash construction operations um, that's it for this unit let me know if you have any questions let me know if you would like additional materials on local exhaust ventilation uh, the textbook is a good resource even though I'm not requiring you to read it it is a good resource as well as the uh, industrial ventilation manual from the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists if you end up down the road needing to to uh, beef up your knowledge of industrial ventilation systems